Okay. So, uh, sorry for the delay. Richard was uh, having trouble connecting this morning. So welcome to our, our webinar for the SIG HPC education section. Uh, just a, a couple of announcements before we start. I'm Steve Gordon, I'm the current chair, uh, but uh, soon will not be. Uh, uh, we sent out a notice to members uh, about nominations for officers. Those are still open until the uh, end, of, end of this month. Uh, there are uh, three regular officers, uh, chair, vice chair, and secretary treasurer. Uh, for those offices, you need to be a member of both ACM and this uh, and the chapter. And then there are two at-large members uh, with, who only need to be a member of the chapter. You're certainly encouraged to nominate uh, others or to self-nominate, and those um, nominations can be sent to uh, to me as uh, uh, as chair of the. Um, uh, of, of the current uh, chapter, and you can find that information with my uh, address on uh, sighpceducation.acm.org. Uh, we expect then to uh, have a ballot out in the mail uh, uh, sometime in uh, April uh, with the new officers taking over the uh, uh, second week of May. So with, uh, with that aside, I'd like to now introduce Richard Gass from the University of Cincinnati. And uh, Richard's put together a draft set of competencies for undergraduate uh, computational physics. And uh, I'll let uh, him introduce those uh, ideas uh, as, as well. So Richard, if you want to go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, let me turn my uh, screen sharing on. Uh, okay. Okay, so can people see my screen? Yes, it's on. Okay, uh, so what I want to talk about today, and I hope get uh, you know fair amount of uh, feedback on and questions about, are competencies for undergraduate computational physics, and I think you'll see from the list that um, that this is a pretty uh, ambitious set of competencies, and so many departments and many programs, I think, will not meet them all. Um, you might meet all of these if you were really offering a degree in computational physics, but probably not if you were offering a uh, certificate. Um, so with that said, um, right, one of the things that I think is really important to teach students is, is what I've called here basic computational thinking. Now, is the screen large enough for people to, to read? Yeah, it's readable. Okay, because I can turn it up a little if necessary. Um, so uh, I think basic computational thinking, despite the name basic, is actually very hard to teach students. Um, and it's hard to teach students really what should be computed and what they should not compute and how to extract physics from a computation. Uh, because after all, what we really want is scientific insight. Um, and I think it's also hard to teach students about uh, validation and verification. You know, is the model the right model? Is it good enough? Are you solving it correctly? Um, and what do the results mean? Uh, and, you know, what can you do to check the code? Um, and, uh, of course, we also want to teach them, uh, you know, good programming practices, um, and I think it's important to do that from the beginning. Um, you know, how does a computation scale uh, in terms of cores, memory, number of CPUs, so forth? Um, and, of course, they need to know how to communicate the results in a clear manner so that someone else can understand them, and how to write code that other people can use and understand. Um, and so that means writing modular code and documenting it properly. Um, and in my experience, it's relatively easy to get students to code and much harder to get them to write anything that other people can use. Um, and I also want them to understand what Bob Panoff refers to as time to science. Okay, In other words, Right. Do I really need my code to run faster, or should I just wait um, rather than spending a month rewriting the code? Or, in fact, do I have to have my code run faster and the additional time 
uh, may be a pain, but there's not much to be done about it because this code is going to have to run thousands of times. Um, so uh, I want to show it. I want to show kind of a uh, okay, cautionary example, and this should format here in a second. Here we go, uh, which I've entitled here the pitfalls of lack of computational thinking. And uh, this is a case where a student doing a project on um, in-body systems under the influence of gravitation has started a set of, of bodies at the center which he's throwing outwards. And you'll see they do exactly what they should do. They go out, their energy all becomes potential, they fall back in, and everything looks good. And this is a uh, potential with a cutoff so it never goes to infinity, so that you know 1 over r goes to 1 over r plus epsilon. Um, and this was handed in actually by a pretty good student, an A and B student, so I don't think we can dismiss what's about to happen as, um, you know, just a result of, of a poor student. Um, so he runs this for a while, uh, and of course this is a chaotic system, and so although you don't see it yet in the plot, he's accumulating little numerical errors, okay, which will shortly become catastrophic and have right there, and although the orbital dynamics here is uh, actually really fascinating. Um, it's also totally meaningless. And if he'd used a different integrator or changed his accuracy of the integrator, he would have got a totally different result. Uh, and actually, I would have been completely fine with this had he realized what was going on and used this to discuss chaotic systems. Uh, but instead, he thought this was physically relevant and meaningful. Uh, and I think this is part of the trap that students fall into in that they get, you know, in many cases, uh, results back and they're pretty pictures and so on, and they tend to believe them without um, being really critical of it. Uh, and so I think that's something that, um, and I mean, this was a student in my class, so I'm guilty here, um, but I think that this is something that we really have to work hard uh, to try to prevent. Uh, now, at the other end of the scale, uh, I think we can often get great insight through computation. Um, and so here's an example of that where, um, at least I hope this is an example, um, that comes from a quantum mechanics class I'm teaching. Um, and we do a asymmetric well uh, and compute the energy levels and probability densities uh, for a couple of states, the ground state here labeled psi naught and the in blue, and the first excited state labeled psi one, which is in red. Uh, and we talk about then why the wave function is uh, so asymmetric and centered around the, um, the, the slightly deeper well for the ground state. Um, and that we'd have to tunnel in the classically forbidden region to get from one part of the well to the other. And this also allows us to talk about where is kinetic energy of the particle greater. And so where should the particle be spending its time? And then we can talk about the first excited state where we're above the barrier and don't have to tunnel. And then we can move up and talk about, say, the second excited state where we see the asymmetry start to wash out because, of course, now we're up enough in the energy landscape so we're no longer as sensitive to the bottom of the potential and it's the walls that start to become important and they are symmetric. And this is the type of quantum mechanical insight that I really don't think you can gain without doing computation. Uh, I certainly didn't have this sort of insight as a graduate student, um, and of course this would have been a, uh, you know, a substantial problem. I'm old enough, so this would have been a substantial computational problem as a graduate student, whereas, um, you know, now this all runs in seconds on any modern desktop or laptop. Um, and along with this, I think we want to teach certain high-level skills, uh, such as how to estimate the accuracy of a solution in a real-world pro problem. And 
an awareness of picking an algorithm suitable for the problem and also understanding that all algorithms have limitations. And I often hear students complain that the, you know, stuff is broken. Um, and actually, it's just that they've picked the wrong algorithm and they should be thinking about that rather than complaining the, about the algorithm. Um, I want them to understand both accuracy and precision and what the difference is between them. And I want them to know how to go from dimensionless computational units to physical units and back and forth. Okay. And I also want them to know when it comes time to write code that is fast, how to figure out where the code's spending its time and thus where they should be looking to speed up the code and where it doesn't matter. So these are kind of the high level things that I think are really important and I may have missed some things uh, and I would welcome comments and suggestions uh, for, uh, for skills that I may have missed. Um, and then, of course, we expect somebody who knows how to do computational physics okay, uh, to actually know some topics in computational physics. Okay? And wherever possible, I think these should all be taught in a physics context. Uh, and so I've listed some physics topics. And these are just meant to be suggestions. They're not meant to be uh, sort of prescriptions. Uh, and at different institutions where people have different interests um, and different tastes, then I'm sure that these will uh, will vary. Uh, so sort of the base, of course, of this is computer arithmetic and errors. Okay? Um, and I'm struggling a little to get uh, good um, physics topics for this. Um, there was a suggestion for accumulation of errors and internal reflections within a sphere, uh, but I'm very much looking here for additional suggestions uh, for physics topics. And if anybody has some that occur to them off the top of their head, this would be a good time to chime in. Uh, yeah, so I don't hear anybody. So uh, just remind yes. people that, that they can use the question and answer uh, button on the viewer to, uh, to send us a question. Uh, there, is a, there is a slight time delay, but as those come, I will pass them on to Richard. Uh, yeah, so I'm kind of pleading for physics topics here. Um, I feel that uh, there's only one here, and there's... Uh, some actual substantial physics setup in order to get to it. Um, so I, I feel this section is a bit weak. Okay. Uh, now, of course, we, we want all our students to know linear algebra for both real and complex um, matrices. So things like the solution of systems of linear equations, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and when it comes to computation, the difference between a sparse and a normal matrix and, you know, just how much uh, storage space is saved by that um, and that sparse matrices really arise naturally in things like the solution of partial differential equations. Um, here, the problem with the physics topics is not finding them, but the richness of topics. Um, so I've listed a few, but, uh, but there are many more, of course. There are normal modes of coupled oscillators, solution of Laplace's equations, standing waves on a drum if you do it by finite differences. Um, and then, of course, there are lots of topics in quantum mechanics. Um, I'll show an example of one a little later. Um, a, although actually the computation for the first quantum mechanics example I showed was done by finding normal modes or by finding uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix using an eigenfunction expansion. Um, so here we have a rich domain of physics topics. Um, and of course I should know numerical integration. Um, and I've said including Gaussian quadrature because that's, um, you know, such a standard uh, method. And for low dimensional integrals, 
uh, they should probably know Simpson and they should know at least one other method uh, and that's as much because I want them to know that there are numerous methods for doing integrals numerically and that it's important to pick a suitable one for your problem uh, rather than because I care what particular method they know. Um, and for higher dimensional integrals, of course, they need to know something about Monte Carlo and understand why um, you would not want to use, say, Gaussian quadrature for a seven-dimensional integral uh, because of the scaling. Um, and although numerical integrals occur frequently, uh, once again, here I feel my physics topics are a bit weak. The uh, finite pendulum, of course, comes to mind um, for a low dimensional case, but I think this should be fleshed out with additional topics. And for uh, applications of Monte Carlo integration, um, here uh, I'm also really looking for some physics topics that aren't um, super specialized so that the students can, you know, so that they're readily accessible to the students and you don't have to spend an hour or so teaching the students some specialized piece of physics just for a uh, integration application. But this is another case where I'm uh, I'm really hoping that other people can provide some suggestions here. Uh, they should, of course, know about numerical differentiation. Uh, and of course, the most straightforward way to do this is for finite differences. And at some point, they need to see numerical differentiation of noisy data. Um, and just what happens when you start to take finite differences of noisy data. Um, there are, once again, lots of physics topics here. Uh, Laplace's equation comes to mind. Uh, I think they should do some numerical differentiation of data from a physics lab uh, so that they get experience playing with real data. Um, and although I have not listed it here, uh, if they're doing numerical differentiation of real data, this might be a really good time to uh, talk about, say, spectral methods um, for taking a derivative. Uh, that are less susceptible to noise, or for smoothing methods, methods or boxcar averaging, uh, or that sort of thing, just to deal with the difficulties of numerical differentiation of real data. Um, so I'd be interested, too, on uh, people's opinion on that, if anybody would like to pipe up. No, no questions. No so questions. Far. Okay. Um, another vital topic, of course, is solution of ordinary differential equations. Um, Euler is, of course, the simplest method, uh, but it's uh, and so it's the first method I teach students. But um, it's not very good um, since it's not energy conserving. Um, so right after I teach students Euler, we talk about why Euler's really not a very good method. Uh, and then we talk about some other methods, uh, you know, leapfrog or Verlet algorithm. Uh, and of course, the industry standard, Runga Kutta. Um, and right, the difference between a symplectic and a non-symplectic method. Um, you know, I don't think most students are ever going to write, nor should they, their own Runga Kutta um, algorithm is anything other than sort of an exercise, uh, but I do think it's important to realize why Runga Kutta is the industry standard and Euler is not. Um, and uh, then, of course, there are various different types of uh, initial value pro of ODEs, initial value problems, which are, of course, the simplest for them to solve. Uh, boundary value problems, where they may have to implement a shooting algorithm or something like that. And then, of course, eigenvalue problems. Um, and uh, that's sort of the order I discuss them in, um, because, of course, 
if they're going to implement something like a shooting method to solve a boundary value problem, they need to know how to solve an initial value problem first. Um, of course, there are lots of other methods um, to solve ODEs, but uh, they're all more sort of specialized. And once they realize there are several methods, um, at least I hope they will start thinking about which method might be best for the problem at hand. Uh, and once again, the uh, list of physics topics here is very rich, right? Celestial mechanics, chaotic systems, all sorts of quantum mechanics, molecular dynamics problems, um, right? Um, everybody will have their favorite, and um, and I suspect everybody will will teach somewhat different physics uh, topics here. Um, although you'll see at the end, there are a list of things that. Um, that I think and the, um, you know, other people who've looked over this think uh, is sufficiently important so that probably there's some subset of topics that every student should at least have seen. Um, and of course, now we get to partial differential equations um, where there are lots of different um, types of problems and boundary conditions and eigenvalue problems. Um, and the most straightforward method of for many is right of course finite differences uh, and so you could there's uh, Laplace's equation or the diffusion and heat equation or you could do wave packet dynamics and quantum mechanics um, okay and I actually have an example of wave packet dynamics uh, which I do um, in uh, my quantum mechanics class, and I like this example because it's a, a way in which you can bring uh, actually very current work um, into a class at, you know, at a senior quantum mechanics level. Um, after you've talked about, say, wave packet, you know, scattering of a plane wave off a barrier, um, if you've talked about uh, solving partial differential equations, say by method of lines, uh, in a computational physics class, uh, then you can do the following interesting problem. Uh, and this was first looked at in a somewhat different situation in 2006. And actually, the first experiments on wave packet splitting uh, were done in 2007 in Bose Einstein condensates. The uh, animation I'm about to show you is a little more complicated than that, but we have a moving well. We have a wave packet that's sitting here in the first well. It's sitting in the ground state, um, so it's essentially stationary here because the initial uh, other two wells are too far away to have any real effect. And now we bring the moving well in and sweep it across the stationary well. Uh, and you can actually do this in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and then will sweep it across a second well. And this gives you an opportunity to talk about uh, not only the quantum mechanics, but you know, are these little ripples here real or are they numerical noise? They're numerical noise. Um, and also a good opportunity to talk about how we should really interpret the physics that, you know, it's not that it's a probability that we're picking up a wave packet, not that we're uh, sort of picking up a piece. Um, and so this is the sort of thing that, of course, you really cannot do without computation. Uh, and so it's a way in which I feel that computation really enhances the undergraduate and, for that matter, the graduate physics curriculum. Okay, now, of course, there are finite elements as well, and so uh, once possible physics topics are, of course, Laplace or Poisson, and also things like quantum dots. Uh, so this is an example that I use in class um, done with finite elements, and you can see the mesh here from the uh, region. And I've picked a non-simply connected region um, both because it's actually pretty easy to do computationally and because quantum mechanics and non-simply connected regions is pretty interesting. Uh, 
but also because one of the things that I emphasize in quantum mechanics and I try to really drive home to the students is that the ground state probability density is always just a lump of some sort regardless of how complicated the situation is and so here we can I can show them that even though we've got a complicated region what we have is a lump um, and we can look at that and then we can talk about why the probability density is centered in this region here uh, and not um, squeezed in between these smaller holes uh, and that allows us to talk about things like curvature of the wave function and energy trade-offs and so on uh, and how we want to how to get the minimum of the ground state uh, energy and after they do a few of these um, and this calculation takes uh, about five seconds on my desktop machine so it's perfectly feasible to do a lot of these uh, with different geometries after they do a few of these they can develop some physical intuition um, in, a, in a way that I really think without computation uh, takes years um, if you develop it at all uh, and for finite elements once again the list of physics topics I've only listed two but is you know extraordinarily rich and diverse um, uh, then a little more specialized but it's still a huge industry are finite difference time domain um, and uh, the obvious physics topic here is the solution of Maxwell's equations in either one or two spatial dimensions um, you know three dimensions really ups the computational time uh, and I'm not sure that it um, you know that it that there's much physics payoff or computational payoff uh, from going from two to three dimensions um, in going from one to two I believe there is uh, because you now have to really uh, grapple with the uh, with the vector nature of the problem um, okay. uh, probably all students should know at least something about numerical root finding um, and once again they should probably know more than one method so just so that they're aware that there are multiple methods of root finding and I've kind of listed the uh, most common ones here of course there's uh, right there's Newton and then there's just recursive bisection which of course is um, in a sense kind of dumb and primitive but um, works very well and actually works very well on some pathological problems um, where more sophisticated methods in fact fail uh, and then they should probably know the secant method as well um, and here too the list of physics topics is rich so I've listed you know finding the energy uh, states for a finite square well uh, certainly a standard quantum mechanics problem that everyone does uh, waves on a circular drum this introduces them to the roots of Bessel functions um, and is another standard problem uh, but the possibilities are widely varied and and very rich here in terms of root finding um, okay and so it's an important topic I think both in terms of just pure computation and also in the physics that it brings to the table um, there are Monte Carlo methods um, and I have to say that I originally left these off um, but my colleagues who reviewed this who do more statistical physics than I do um, were fairly adamant that uh, students should learn something about Monte Carlo methods um, and of course there are lots of physics topics here there's a one and two dimensional Ising model um, those are both actually fairly easy to do using Monte Carlo methods uh, and so this could easily be worked into a course in statistical physics where you're certainly going to discuss these anyway um, there are simulation of fluids uh, you know either as hard spheres or disks or Leonard Jones models percolation models random walks and of course one can um, do radioactive decay this way um, 
And in fact, it's probably the best way of doing radioactive decay since radioactive decay is, of course, really a discrete process that we model with a continuous differential equation. Um, and I, I don't think actually that most undergraduates really appreciate that. Um, this is a case where the discrete process is in fact the exact case and the continuous process is a model. So all students should know something about uh, Fourier transforms um, and uh, there are lots of physics topics here of course so for instance they could you could talk when you did chaotic systems about power spectrums from a chaotic system how do you know the system is chaotic um, there are lots of opportunities here too for weaving computation in uh, to a lab uh, or analyzing data from labs so you know students frequently have spectrum data from labs that they might want to take the Fourier transform of. Um, one thing that uh, we do with our students in our advanced lab is we have a scanning tunneling microscope um, and they image graphite with that and of course the image is always a little noisy um, and so we have them uh, take the uh, Fourier transform of that, <coughs> excuse me, and um, and throw away the small components, <coughs> which all are uh, small amplitude components, which all come from the non-periodic noise, um, and then Fourier transform back, and their image, of course, since it was of graphite, which has a regular lattice structure, is periodic. Uh, and so they can use a Fourier transform to clean up the non-periodic noise, do a little image processing, and get a much better result. Um, and um, they're always uh, a little surprised by how well this works. Um, but there are lots of opportunities for Fourier transforms uh, on real data. Um, <clears throat> Then I've listed uh, separately, but uh, maybe I should have bundled it all into one, uh, things like Fourier series and discrete Fourier transforms and fast Fourier transforms. Um, of course, for Fourier series, uh, waves on a string is a good topic. There are lots of quantum mechanics topics. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, and that's a good place too to maybe introduce discrete Fourier transforms. Um, one experiment that we have our students do in a lab um, is to push a um, a cart with a on an air table, on an air track actually, not a table, that has a uh, a very precise quartz oscillator. Uh, that makes very annoying noise uh, on it, but the frequency of that noise is known very accurately. So they shove that down an air track with a velocity of only a couple meters a second, um, and it bounces off the bumper and comes back to them. And during that experiment, they record the uh, the noise made by the oscillator with a microphone and they input it into a computer and they take the fast Fourier transform of it and they can see the shift in the peak um, and thus use the Doppler effect to calculate the velocity of the cart uh, which we separately have them uh, measure with a sonic uh, ranger so that um, they can see uh, just how you make a Doppler shift measurement and you know how precisely you can do that um, because you can precisely determine a frequency and here we talk about how long this would take if you did not use a fast Fourier transform and how much you save uh, on a big data set by using a fast Fourier transform rather than a regular transform um, and it's a good opportunity too to talk about how things scale as your data size gets larger and larger and how that depends critically on your algorithm. 
Um, and this is another area where um, there are lots of opportunities to bring um, data from a lab in. There are lots of physics topics. I've listed only one, but everybody will have their favorite. Um, okay. uh, when we talk about labs, too, we should probably talk about curve fitting um, and uh, the ability to use log-log and log-linear scales. Uh, and so they should fit some real data from their own labs um, and or from publicly uh, available data, um, you know, sites such as NASA or CERN, um, they can curve fit to, um, you know, the uh, Planck data from a, a cosmic microwave background, for instance. Uh, there are lot lots of good public data sites with scientifically interesting data. And of course, many of them will be doing undergraduate research projects uh, that will generate data that they're going to need to, uh, to curve fit to um, and understand something about standard deviation and what their errors mean and so forth. Um, so though errors are not explicitly listed here, um, this is probably a good point or, you know, good time to work them in. Um, visualization, of course, is, uh, I think, extremely important for extracting uh, the physics from a computation. Um, and I think here it's important to emphasize that what we want from visualization is the ability to understand the physics or mathematics uh, that we're doing. And in terms of physics topics, well, that's essentially everything, um, okay, except for some symbolic calculations. It's really hard to think of a topic where we don't want to do some visualization. Um, and so this is something to, that um, certainly we try to work in, and I think everyone else does too, throughout the curriculum. Um, part of computation these days, of course, is symbolic mathematics. Um, hey, I believe students should always know in theory how to do this by how to do the calculation by hand. Uh, but of course, calculations will frequently be sufficiently large so that they're either very tedious and error prone to do by hand or simply really not possible by hand. Uh, and so they should know some symbolic language, whether that's Mathematica or Maple or Sage, um, will depend on the um, tastes um, and to some extent religion of uh, the people at that institution, as well as, of course, on what the licensing situation is, um, what is it that is cheap and readily available. Uh, for the students. Uh, but I think all physics majors who, well, really all physics majors, but certainly all physics majors who are getting either a degree or a minor or a certificate in computational physics should be proficient with s some symbolic language. Um, and if they know one, it will be relatively easy, I think, for them to switch. Um, and in terms of physics topics, I would say you just sort of integrate this throughout the curriculum um, when and where it's appropriate. Um, I always make them do small calculations by hand first, um, but then for larger things, I encourage the use in, at our institute institution in Mathematica. Um, we have a site license, and so it's cheap and easy for us to do that. Um, that won't, of course, be the case at, other, at all institutions who may want to use some other symbolic manipulator. Okay. Now, I, these are kind of grouped under other, other skills, um, and I think some of them are, are more important than others. Um, Okay, and so they're not kind of physics or numerical topics, but they're skills that I think students ought to have. And I think they should know they should know at least the basics of a Unix or Linux operating system, as well as some Windows-based system. Uh, I don't really care whether it's Windows or 
or OS X or something else. Um, but just to know that, you know, there are Windows based systems and there are also command line based systems. Um, and they should know how to, you know, at least change a directory in a Unix system, list files, run some program. They should know how to run a batch job. Um, they should know a compiled language, um, whether that's, you know, C or Java or Python. Um, I'm not sure how much difference that makes. Personally, I would be inclined to uh, C or Python these days. Um, and once they know one, they can probably pick up the other pretty quickly. Uh, I think they should know how to use LaTeX, even though journals are becoming more lax and allowing you to submit uh, Word documents or Mathematica notebooks for professional uh, publishing in physics and mathematics. Uh, really, I believe you should know how to use LaTeX. Um, I think you ought to know how to use a numerical library. Um, and at least the basics of creating a numerical library. Um, and I always encourage students to use libraries when possible. Um, your own code is never going to be as fast and as robust and as well bug tested as some uh, community library, which has been extensively gone over both by experts and by the general user community. Um, my colleagues all thought that some experience with version control, such as Git, uh, was really important. Um, I guess my feeling is I feel less strongly about this, um, that if you're getting an undergraduate degree in computational physics, that probably should make the list. If you're getting a certificate, um, clearly not all these things are going to make the list and you're going to have to pick and choose. Um, and I'm not sure I'd choose Git but, uh, or version control, but there are certainly lots of people who would disagree with me on that point. Um, I do feel strongly that at some point students should do some respectable computational project um, where uh, they have to think about the project from sort of start to finish, um, learn that they should think before they write code, um, and think about the physics before they write code, and then what the results mean and how to put all this together and, uh, and talk about it and give a oral presentation or a poster on it. Um, and this could be a summer research project. It could be a project in a computational physics course. It could be a senior thesis or whatever. Um, but at some point, I really believe that students learn a lot by doing that sort of thing. Um, and we're shortchanging them um, if we let them out without requiring it. Um, and I particularly I uh, think that an oral presentation is important um, as most of my students are not very good at that when they the first time. Um, okay. And as far as physics topics go, I have emphasized that you know people are going to do different physics topics. They should do different physics topics. Uh, there are some, however, that are so important that um, there may be widespread agreement, and I'd be very interested in disagreement here or additional nominations. Um, but probably every s student should see the Schrod a numerical solution to the Schrodinger equation, to the Ising model, to Laplace, okay, to Maxwell in at least one dimension. Uh, I think they should see a chaotic system. Um, Fourier series, the idea of expansion and orthogonal functions, and what implications this has for real-world data where you have only a limited number of measurements, um, and some analysis of real-world data. Um, and if uh, people have additional suggestions or they disagree and they think some of these are not so important, um, I'd really like to hear that. 
Um, and in general, um, I'm kind of coming to the end here. I hope there's some discussion, um, suggestions or comments or criticisms, um, additions, deletions. So Richard, since this is going to be uh, also posted on YouTube, uh, perhaps on that last slide you could put your email address so that if people are watching it asynchronously, they can write you for these suggestions. Yes, let me uh, do that right now. Okay, so uh, there's my email address. Um, so uh, I hope to get lots of suggestions, uh, constructive criticism. Um, as far as additional topics, um, are concerned it's already a pretty long list so if you have additional topics I want to urge that you suggest deletions as well all right well let's open it up for for questions for those that are on live so reminder that you can use the Q&A tool to to send a question and uh, as we receive them we'll try to answer those so let's uh, pause for a minute since there is some time delay and and see if there are uh, questions or comments from the audience. Thank you, Richard, for, for that uh, presentation. By uh, the way. You're welcome. Glad to do it. So a reminder while we're waiting for questions that this, uh, if you want to go back and review uh, what Richard has done, uh, I will be editing the video uh, of this broadcast uh, over the next day or so, and it will be posted on the YouTube channel of the uh, chair at SIGHPCEducation.com, uh, which is the sponsor of the, of this uh, of these uh, some webinars for the chapter. Um, so you should should see them in a couple of days. So that if you want to go back and reflect on the on the details, uh, you'll have that, and you'll also have uh, contact information for Richard. So I'm not seeing any questions yet, Richard. So um, I want to thank you again, and uh, I will uh, uh, post the uh, link to the uh, to the YouTube on the uh, SIGHPC.ACM.org uh, web pages uh, sometime in the next few days. Yeah, so thank you again, and thank you all of those who are listening, and um, everybody have a good uh, upcoming weekend. Okay, thanks, Steve. Glad to do it. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye.